The uh, next case for oral argument is uh, Dar Darcy Brocken versus South Dakota Department of Labor and Regulation. Uh, Eric Schulte is present and will be arguing on behalf of uh, Ms. Bracken. And uh, Seth Lepore and Courtney Chapman appear uh, on behalf of the South Dakota Department of Labor and Regulation. Mr. Lepore will be arguing this morning. Uh, each side will have 15 minutes for your initial argument, and then Mr. Schulte will have a five minute rebuttal. You can proceed. Chief Justice, may it please the court, counsel, my name is Eric Schulte. It's my privilege today to represent Darcy Bracken in this matter. This is an administrative appeal arising out of a ruling from May 26th of 2022 by the circuit court finding that Ms. Bracken was ineligible to receive pandemic related unemployment benefits that were previously uh, stated by the Department of Labor to be at her, uh, uh, for her to rightfully apply for. Ms. Bracken appeals, and there is one issue, I believe, for the court to decide whether the circuit court erred in affirming the determination by the Department of Labor that Ms. Bracken was ineligible. The circuit court affirmed a ruling stating that the pandemic resulted in merely indirect economic consequences to Ms. Bracken's bed and breakfast in Hermosa and because of that standard, she was not eligible to receive benefits that they had previously approved. The circuit court judge viewed this as a factual uh, determination, uh, Mr. Schulte, and, and applied a, a clear error standard, and that seemed to really matter in terms of, of uh, his view of the case. Yes. Um, is it that, or are we really reviewing and interpreting the text of what I, I call the, the the self-employment you know, criteria or the self-employment category, that seems more legal. I, I think it's, it's both with more to the latter, if I may explain, Your Honor. Uh, Judge Hendrickson in his ruling, uh, uh, the court's words were, this leaves a bad taste in my mouth to rule this way, but he didn't think that he could disturb the standard of review. That was the language that the court used. Um, the, uh, the, that arises or creates many issues, uh, um, but first of which, if you look at the factual standard of review, clearly erroneous, I think there is an error here uh, because Ms. Bracken's business, it's undisputed, was substantially uh, uh, impacted by the pandemic. But more to the point, Your Honor, uh, I believe it was also an error of law because the incorrect legal standard was applied. And that's what the brief submitted to the court primaris, primarily focused on. Uh, the <coughs> phrase that was used by the ALJ in this matter is indirect economic consequences. And it specifically states um, uh, the uh, loss of guests is an indirect economic consequence of the pandemic. The ALJ did not cite any legal authority for that sentence in the opinion but said without more, there was no way that Ms. Bracken was entitled to benefits. <clears throat> but Jack, go ahead, please. Your opposing counsel seems to be relying on the disaster unemployment assistance regulations. Yes. So tell us about your position with respect to their application to this pandemic law. Sure, uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, the DUA is a series of regulations, as I understand it, passed in 1974, not part of the CARES Act, but there is a reference in the CARES Act to the DUA. Um, the position that I've asserted in the brief is that it does not apply, and this is the reason why, Your Honor. The uh, CARES Act specifically has criteria which is given to the states when PUA benefits are supposed to be distributed. The DUA is only looked at if there is something silent in the CARES Act, which is not here, or if there is potentially a conflict, and I don't think there is a conflict that triggers anything for application of the DUA, in a nutshell, Your Honor. The, uh, the phrase that the appellee has seized on is direct result, and that's the language which is being asked to uh, this court to look at. And I don't believe that that is something that needs to be reviewed, even though that language is not in, in the CARES Act. It's not, I believe, triggered 
because the CARES Act does not define the term or have the term specifically direct result in it. Instead, in the CARES Act, under 15 U.S.C. 9021, um, uh, there is authority uh, for the Federal Secretary of Labor to delegate to the states how to distribute money. And under UIPL letters, changes four and five, it says the criteria is a significant diminution in your customary or usual uh, business. That's the criteria which is stated there. It's quoted by the ALJ, but not applied. Now, that's very clear guidance for the states to use with respect to whether or not this aid is available to a person such as Ms. Bracken, which is unemployed. So the significant diminution text would get at what we were talking about earlier. That's sort of the quantum of evidence. Is it enough? Is it diminished yes. enough? But then there's that because of language, which yes. seems like a causation standard. Yes. And, you know, as, as we discussed earlier, you really don't get to... Uh, to talking about the, the quality or even the quantum of the evidence unless unless you have that uh, that causation standard satisfied um, and it seemed like the circuit court was 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 maybe more focused on the factual uh, component of that but they seem to be both present and I guess my my question is um, as a state court as we are can we just interpret the words that are written down in the English language by the Secretary of Labor and apply our normal rules of construction and figure out what they mean. I believe that you can, Your Honor. I believe you can. There is sparse case law on this that the parties have cited. But we've cited the Minnesota uh, appellate decision of uh, Hyatt Muse, which interprets the CARES Act and the DUA. And it says you're supposed to look at this and really try to effectuate the will of Congress. That's the language that the Minnesota Court of Appeals used. And I think under uh, basic interpretation of changes four and five, if you look at the appropriate test of a significant diminution in your customary business, that was clearly met in the record in this particular case, and it demands reversal. Uh, there's nothing in the CARES Act that talks about a direct result. There's certainly no phrase in the CARES Act that says indirect economic consequences. That text is used, however, but it's used in other criteria established by Congress relating to not self-employed uh, people, but people who are otherwise employed by, by an employer. But that direct language does exist, but not in this criteria. Uh, correct, Your Honor, it, and, it, and it does exist. And part of the argument I'm trying to advance in the brief and before this court is that we can't consider the context of the pandemic in a vacuum for what happened at that particular time. The pandemic upended the lives of countless Americans. It impacted our economy. And Congress enacted the CARES Act in order to throw a financial lifeline to people such as Ms. Bracken. And specifically, there was criteria for people that are self-employed, which is not normally used in an unemployment situation. Congress said, we're throwing a financial lifeline to people such as Ms. Bracken that are self-employed if they have a significant diminution. Now, in, the, in this particular case, there's no real nuance about what happened. The pandemic happened. There's evidence in the record that the travel industry was significantly damaged. Findings of fact two, three, and four by the administrative law judge demonstrate, I believe, the impact to Ms. Bracken. There's other evidence in the record on that, too. And a basic application of common sense, I think, demonstrates that there was a significant diminution in her business. And even the ALJ hints to that in the opinion, saying that, well, there was business that was lost, but it's only an indirect economic consequence of the pandemic. And so, in yeah. fact, the ALJ is saying there, there were no new reservations in February of 2020 and no guests until the end of May 2020. Yes. Yes, Your Honor, that's precisely what was found. And the predicate fact before that, finding a fact too, is that there were regular guests before the pandemic. So this was a business, while it was small, a small bed and breakfast ran by a husband and wife. They had business until the pandemic, and then the business dried up and went away. It's the precise reason why Congress enacted the CARES Act in the first place, to save businesses such as Ms. Bracken's. And now to, uh, to come back uh, later 
several months later after the state approved this and to say you've got to pay that all back now, even though you were transparent and there's no uh, fault of yours, which is undisputed in this case, we just think is manifestly unfair, Your Honor. So the, the findings that you just mentioned, two, three, and four, that the administrative law judge made in this case, were they ever challenged by uh, the department? Have they been challenged at any point along the way? There was no notice of review filed, Your Honor. So, because as I read the department's brief now, and I'll talk with Mr. Lepore about it, but as I read their brief now, there seems to be almost like a sufficiency of the evidence argument that's, that's kind of surfaced in this case, and I'm wondering if that argument is even around, if those findings haven't been challenged from what your view, you probably agree with that. Well, just... I, Your Honor, I do agree that, the, in, in my opinion, that that argument should not be around because there was no notice of review. It's certainly being argued that there wasn't enough evidence to support it. But the bottom line is, that's what the ALJ found. There's no dispute in this case that there was a loss of business based upon the, the testimony the ALJ heard. Uh, on top of that, Agency Exhibit 3, which is in the record, offered by the appellee uh, in the record is a writing from Ms. Bracken where she outlines how the travel industry was devastated and her business was devastated. So, and, and I respectfully submit, I think there's overwhelming evidence of a significant diminution. In addition in the to there not being a notice of review though, am I right in thinking that, because this, this went through the administrative law judge, it went to the department uh, itself, and then before it all went to the circuit court. But it doesn't seem like the department at any point along the way, even before this point in front of, in front of our court, was that factual determination of, hey, there was guests, now there's not guests, and this occurred during the, the, the COVID restrictions. It doesn't seem like that was ever challenged, or it doesn't seem as though that was ever asserted by the department as a basis to require repayment. I would agree with that, Your Honor. I would agree with that. Uh, it hinges on, in, in, in my view of the record, um, Ms. Bracken was pro se before the circuit court and before the ALJ, but my review of the record is simply this phrase, indirect economic consequences, that without more, uh, you somehow cannot win or are not entitled to these benefits. And that's really what the, the, uh, the reasoning was. And uh, I just would respectfully submit, I don't believe that's the law. That's not what the CARES Act provides. And despite the finality of those findings, though, you would agree that if we were to agree with the interpretation that the ALJ applied, say those, the language in the DUA applies here, your client loses. You know, I, I don't think so. And I anticipated this question, Justice Myron, and thank you for that. If you would use the analysis under the DUA, which is direct result, or the phrase, which I believe is amorphous, indirect economic consequences, I think that the pandemic is still a direct, uh, was a direct result of the devastation to this little bed and breakfast in Hermosa. I think that common sense demands <laughs> that it's a direct result. Um, I've uh, cited in our brief various cases ruled upon by this court, uh, just using common sense and deciding decisions. And I think a, a predicate fact for understanding this is the devastation the pandemic caused not only in South Dakota but across the world. And applying common sense to that test, I think it is a direct result, Your Honor. And I'll ask you this question and I'll ask Mr. Lepore when he comes up or I'll try to. If I don't, I'm sure he'll answer it or attempt to answer it. What could be more direct than what occurred to your client? Yeah, yeah. It, my, my business is closed because I, don't, I no longer get any bookings and I can't allow people to stay at my hotel because of the pandemic. I, I would agree with, with that, Your Honor. Yes, um, it is a direct result. I had bookings before. In February, when rumblings of the pandemic happened, there are no new reservations. I have no guests through May. Uh, there's an exhibit that says that my business was destroyed. I made zero income, which is part of the record. It's expect, as direct as it gets. I expect his response might be your client actually, the, the, a more direct one would be your client actually coming down with COVID and being unable to perform the duties. Yes, which, which didn't happen here. Um, uh, Ms. Bracken was passionate in arguing before the ALJ that she complied with CDC regulations I cleaned my business. I let uh, rooms stay empty for a day or two. 
I, I was diligent with applying with what the government told me to do, the CDC, and she didn't come down with COVID. My response to that is that ultimately though, if you look at the criteria that is established under the CARES Act, that that should be irrelevant. If a self-employed person has a significant diminution in their business, they're eligible for benefits, and frankly, that's why the DOL approved her application in the first place. It may be a moot point in any event under the because of language, because if there are no guests, whether she's sick or she's not sick, she has no work to perform. Yes, correct, Your Honor, yes. So, um, to summarize, uh, we believe uh, that the uh, CARES Act uh, specifically allows for her to apply. It was appropriately uh, applied. Uh, there's sparse uh, case law uh, on this. Um, uh, with the time remaining, I know Mr. Lepore may talk about the Martin case from Utah, and I think it's important to talk about that. It's the one case that he cites, but we respectfully disagree with, uh, with the Martin case. Um, we believe it's an overbroad reading of the uh, UI uh, PLs, the change letters sent by the uh, uh, Federal uh, uh, Labor Secretary, and the facts of that case are significantly different too. Uh, in uh, uh, Martin, uh, the claimant was at fault, unlike Ms. Bracken, lived in Columbia, was applying for PUA benefits while living in Columbia and was Mr. at fault. Mr. Schulte, I'll, I'll let you finish up. If you want to talk more about the Martin case on reply, you can do that. I do that, Your Honor. And we would, yes, Your Honor. Thank you. <clears throat> and that would be, I would conclude my remarks and Thank save you. them for rebuttal. Thank you. Mr. LaFleur, you may uh, proceed with your argument. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, uh, members of the court, counsel, may it please the court. My name is Seth Lepore, and along with Courtney Chapman, we represent the APALE, the South Dakota Department of Labor and Regulation, Division of Reemployment Assistance Division. Today, we're asking the court to affirm the circuit court and thereby ALJ McCabe for three reasons. First, ALJ McCabe correctly applied the direct result that's found in the CARES Act and the Disaster Unemployment Assistance Act. Second, there's a complete failure of evidence to show any causal link between COVID-19 and the reduction of business in this case. And lastly, given the constrained record in this case and the applicable standards of review, uh, this, in, this supports affirming ALJ McCabe. Well, I want to ask you about the absence of evidence. We've got some findings in the, uh, in the ALJ's decision that indicates that there was an impact as a result of, of COVID-19. We don't have the transcript of the hearing. Uh, how do we assess complete failure of, of evidence when we've got these findings? How do we assess that those are erroneous or incorrect? That, that's correct, Your Honor. As this court's aware, the, uh, the transcript from the ALJ hearing is not part of the record. And as Justice Salter indicated, there is maybe an issue as to what standard review was used by the circuit court. But in the end, this court's rule on that subject is that the court can only review the record that it's presented with. And ultimately, the appellant is the person responsible for preserving that record. Uh, so to the extent this court would apply a clearly erroneous standard, that would apply only to the findings of fact. Uh, the application of those findings to the law would be a de novo review. Uh, the interpretation of the law would also be a de novo review. But uh, wouldn't you have to challenge the findings first? Uh, respectfully, Your Honor, I do believe that, that that position has been preserved for this court. If this court reviews the transcript of the proceedings before just Judge Hendrickson, uh, I specifically raise the issue that there was not a significant uh, reduction showing in this case. There's two things I, two thoughts that come to my mind. One is that soon enough because this, that was appeal, that was an intermediate appeal essentially by a circuit court judge. The die in the administrative proceeding was already cast. The department had made the decision that it made to require repayment of the benefits. And it looks to me like the only reason they identified 
was related to whether she qualified and was eligible under this rule that I want to talk about in a few moments. So there's that. But the other thought that occurs to me is the circuit court judge said something along the lines of, I don't know how your business couldn't have been impacted. So I'm not sure that the circuit court really believed that her business was unaffected or there was, that there was insufficient evidence. I don't know how your business wouldn't be affected by COVID. So it seems like the circuit court didn't really accept that argument, even if you preserved it. That may be correct, Your Honor, but the circuit court did not take the one step further because it couldn't, because we didn't have the transcript. But as a reminder, the claimant also didn't present any physical evidence at the hearing either. So the, the factual determinations that arise out of ALJ McCabe's decision are based purely on the testimony and the self-certification. Uh, th there were no exhibits offered at that hearing. But back to the, back to the uh, comment by Judge Hendrickson, I, I do take issue with that comment because, as Mr. Schulte has argued, he wants a common sense approach to this case. Well, the department is not contesting COVID-19 happened. The department is not contesting that people were impacted by it. But to assume or to make a statement that there's, there's no possible way you weren't impacted, I think is improper. I, well, I wouldn't you have to seek review on that? If you, if you disagreed with, with uh, the judge's decision, I'm sorry I have to, I don't know how your business wouldn't be affected by COVID. If you disagree with that, that's fine. But don't you have to seek review uh, by notice of review, which our procedures allow for, in order to bring that in front of our court and challenge uh, the decision or challenge those findings on that basis? Your Honor, I think the, the issue on appeal has always been her eligibility under KK1. And that eligibility hinges on whether or not she can show a significant reduction in business of her customary and usual services and the causation element that it was because of COVID-19. I'm glad you mentioned that. So do you agree that we start with the text of that uh, self-employment criteria? And that's where we start? I, I do, Your Honor. And if you look at Section 2102H of the CARES Act, there is an explicit directive that to the extent the CARES Act conflicts with the DUA, the DUA applies. And if this court looks to the UIPLs, it says that to the extent the, uh, the CARES Act and the UIPLs are silent, the DUA applies. So there are two directives. Uh, it's not silent. I mean, it doesn't seem like that's the case. How do you see silence? Yes, Your Honor. Well, arguably because of is, is a significant term in that test, and it is not defined. So in that respect, it is silent. So we do need to go to the DUA to give some context and meaning to that term. So it seems like your argument is that, that you don't want to apply the self-employment criteria, and you'd rather pl apply the, this, this uh, disaster assistance uh, regulation. Your Honor, I, I would say that the result is the same either way. Uh, if, if this court looks at the plain text, the, the because of, and it applies a plain and ordinary meaning, that only meaning that that can be is that there is a short causal chain, that you have a, an event, a reduction in business, that is the result of COVID-19. You agree that the text says that you could satisfy that criteria even without a suspension of services, right? It says that. Yes, Your Honor. So when the ALJ pointed to the fact that she hadn't shut her bed and breakfast down, that would be error at a minimum. Would you agree with that? I, I don't necessarily agree with that because I, I think to show that causal connection and to show the significant reduction, I think it is really a fact-intensive inquiry. So the fact that she didn't shut down, I think, is just a piece of the puzzle. I, I don't think that determination alone is the reason why she was not eligible uh, for the CARES Act money. Is your interpretation so, of the because of um, clause consistent with how this court has um, interpreted or, or um, analyzed causation? In other cases, Your Honor, I know the I know neither party submitted any case law 
to this court uh, defining the term because of or how this court has interpreted because of in the past. But if, if this court took just a plain and ordinary meaning, again, it, it needs to be that short causal chain. In this case, the, the, the causation standard is, is that we have an individual, maybe not in South Dakota, <coughs> maybe overseas, may be impacted by COVID, we don't know, who makes a determination of whether or not to stay at the bed and breakfast. But that is, there's assumptions layered into there because there is no evidence in the record from any of these guests. What, what about Mr. Schulte's point that there's an element of common sense here? The whole point that the CARES Act was enacted and I, you know, there was frankly nobody in this country that didn't appreciate the effect of COVID. So what, what is your response? To that? Yes, Your Honor. I, I certainly understand the common sense approach, but again, I, I believe that it is, it's really a veiled attempt to take judicial notice of COVID-19's impact on businesses. And in a state where we stayed open, and in a state where we advertised our tourism, I, there's a significant question as to whether or not this bed and breakfast actually was impacted to the specific degree by COVID-19. Well, if that's the case, then, then the standard for eligibility could be displied, uh, applied in a desperate, disparate way across the country, depending upon whether the state shut down or didn't shut down. But this is a federal program administered, admittedly, through the states. Uh, is there any intent that, that the results would, would, would vary like that from state to state based upon the three or four line criteria set up by the Secretary of Labor that says if you have a substantial diminution of, of your services because of this, you don't have to shut down, you can still be eligible? Well, Your Honor, I believe that's why this court is in such a unique position. There is virtually no case law on this issue. Because the, the, the CARES Act was a response, a lifeline. The, the, the legislature passed AA through KK of the CARES Act. Interestingly, KK gives the secretary power to define additional criteria for the CARES Act. So KK1 does not exist independently in the code. It is a creation of the secretary of the United States Department of Labor. Well, I understand that. Can we use traditional uh rules of statutory construction or textual interpretation to read that criteria? I believe you can, Your Honor. And, and back to your original point of uh, disparate impact, although the decisions are not binding on this court, the circuit courts in South Dakota have treated this issue wildly different. Uh, Mr. Schulte uh, cited to the case of Koval. Koval was a producer of the film Napoleon Dynamite, and he applied for and got uh, COVID relief money. But in Koval, Judge Klinger refused to go and engage in the DUA analysis because Koval was eligible under different sections of the CARES Act. She specifically found that he had to quit his job because of COVID-19 or that he was guaranteed work that didn't materialize because of COVID-19. So in that sense, Koval is distinguishable. But in the Third and First Circuits, we also have the cases of Lonnie Reedburn and Krista Vogt. In both of those cases, the judges applied a DUA analysis. And the... Uh, were they self-employment cases? They were, Your Honor. In Lonnie Reedburn, <coughs> he was a insurance salesman. And the issue there was, is he said that he could not go out to people's homes and take measurements or get personal information because his clients were elderly and didn't want him in their house. He provided no evidence except testimony at the ALJ level. So what in the um, DUA conflicts with the self-employment provision of the CARES Act? Your Honor, the, the conflict between the DUA with respect to self-employment and the CARES Act is, is that if you look at KK1, it has a because of standard. Everything under the DUA has a direct result. If this court looks at 20 CFR 625.5. That's different. That's not necessarily conflicting. That just might mean different language. But I'll please continue. But. Well, and, and Your Honor, if you, if you look at that section, there are actually three specific sections that are almost mirror images of the CARES Act. Um, that would be sections, excuse me. 
uh, EE, GG, and HH. Those are almost directly mirrored. And that goes back that the intent with that textual reference under 2102H that the DUA applies where there's conflict, that the intent of the CARES Act is really to be modeled after the DUA, given the qualifying conditions under the CARES Act were so closely mirrored to the DUA. But wouldn't we start with the language of the text? In other words, this direct relationship uh, that, that pervades this case isn't so novel. In fact, as Mr. Schulte uh, mentioned and acknowledged, it exists even in some of the criteria or the eligibility criteria that Congress has set out, but not all of them. And the Secretary didn't put it in to this one that we're talking about. So is that a conflict or it's just not there? I mean, I tend to think of textual conflict of saying it gives a direction to do one thing, but another provision says do the exact opposite. That's a conflict. Having different language and different provisions doesn't seem as much a conflict. Well, Your Honor, even if this court decides that there is not a conflict between the DUA and the CARES Act and declines to go into the DUA analysis, the, but, the because of analysis still gets to the same result. What do you think because of means? Your Honor, I think because of means you have a, you have a result, or excuse me, you have an act that is a that directly affects the change. You have the reduction in business that is the immediate result of COVID-19. Is there a difference between the text because of or the standard because of and what we traditionally think of as but for causation? But for causation meaning something happens without which a, a predicate uh, occurring it wouldn't have happened. I believe that's true, Your Honor. Um, and if, if you were to read because of any other way, or if you were to read it um, as, as Mr. Schulte is proposing, then the qualifications under the CARES Act are rendered meaningless. Uh, they're rendered superfluous. I mean, it, there's, there's no need to show that direct link if you're using because of. And that's why Koval is so instructive, is because, you know, Klinger really took the path of least resistance and found that he was eligible because of COVID-19, because there was actual emails present in that case. So, so Council, how is the of... department's uh, position uh, in this case <laughs> consistent with the uh, congressional intent of Congress in the CARES Act? I mean, we have a, a, a person who had a business uh, February 20, no new reservations, May of 20, between February and May, no guests. Uh, and on a, a self-employed person, eventually the business closes. Well, Your Honor, if I may, I, you know, the, the CARES Act has, is an affirmative application for benefits. Ms. Bracken sought these benefits out under the CARES Act, which brought her under the umbrella of state law. This is not a stimulus check that the United States government sent to every single American with no strings attached. Because she affirmatively applied for these benefits, she was required to make that evidentiary showing. And that evidentiary showing is just absent in this case. There's no evidence produced. But she received the benefits. This, I mean, we're not determining her eligibility. We're kind of determining her eligibility looking backwards. We're determining some of these things looking backwards. She won. Initially, she got the benefits. Your Honor, I guess I, I would take issue uh, with that characterization. The, the determination notice that is initially issued to claimants who are seeking CARES Act funds, they get a monetary determination. That determination tells them that they are monetarily eligible, but that the state reserves the right to claw back those funds if they receive new information or uh, if there's error, and that they can, they can do that. That's under 6174. Um, so she she uh, she I'm did get the benefits. Here, Mr. Opar, I've given you a couple extra minutes, but uh, your time is up. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Schulte. You may proceed with rebuttal. Mr. Schulte, do you disagree yes, with the definition of because of that Mr. Lepore applied or, or provided us? I think because of um, 
yes, I, Your Honor. I think it's because of the pandemic that this happened. I don't think there needs to be any additional nuance besides that. It's Is it but for causation? I could live with but for causation, Your Honor. I could live with it, but it's it's because of the pandemic. And uh, I don't think it needs uh, to be more nuanced than that. The will of Congress is outlined in the statute, which gives the secretary the ability under a congressional act to define criteria for self-employed people to obtain uh, uh, funding um, for an emergency. And it's self-employed individuals who experience a significant diminution in their customary or usual services because of the COVID-19 public health emergency. Because of it. And that's what I believe we have here. And the evidence is overwhelming. It's overwhelming. Um, Mr. Lepore argued to this court right now that there's an absence of evidence for you to say it's because of because there are no guests that gave uh, any testimony before the Department of Labor. And I'm trying to think in my mind how realistic that would be for somebody such as Ms. Bracken to do a poll of potential guests from across the United States to call them on the phone and say, were you thinking of maybe traveling to Hermosa at any time during 2020? And that's apparently the argument that's being made to this court why there's an absence of evidence. And I don't think it needs to be that nuanced or difficult. There was evidence in the record that has not been challenged, which says that my business was destroyed because of the pandemic. And to be clear, there is no transcript, which we tried to obtain, the state resisted, and I understand the reasons why, uh, because it wasn't ordered below. But there is evidence in the record. Agency Exhibit 3 is in Ms. Bracken's own handwriting describing what happened to her. The ALJ heard testimony and made findings of fact that were not, that were not challenged. I think the court under SDCL 1-26-21, which is the statute defining the contents of the record, uh, can review everything in this administrative record for making its decision. I think under SDCL 15-26A-10, which gives this court authority for what to review on the record, that that gives you the authority. And there's overwhelming evidence, I believe, in the record to support that there was a significant diminution because of the pandemic and that common sense demands it. Um, is, is it overwhelming evidence or uncontroverted evidence? Well, I would say uncontroverted, for sure, Your Honor. Um, and I also would say it's the only evidence. So to the extent that that's overwhelming evidence, I would, I would agree with that. It's the only evidence and the court found that that's what happened and it wasn't challenged. So I, I simply believe that the, uh, that the evidence is there. In my limited time, uh, I want to pick up on Justice Kern's question about the will of Congress. Now we have cited in our brief to the court how remedial statutes are supposed to be viewed by this court. We've cited a decision, the Moody decision from 1980, then Chief Justice Woolman talking about workers' compensation law, saying that remedial statutes are supposed to be construed in favor, liberally, of the person uh, seeking uh, redress. And by analogy, I think that applies here. This is the most remedial statute in my lifetime for a historic public health emergency. And Ms. Bracken did the right thing by applying for benefits. Her business was failing. And now she's told she has to pay it all back. It's not supported by the law. It's not supported by the law. The ALJ's ruling, uh, indirect economic consequences, doesn't even cite the DUA. It's something that was just put in the opinion. The law is as Congress enacted it. And because she had a significant diminution, I respectfully request that the ruling be reversed. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Thank, uh, thank you, counsel, for your arguments this morning. The case is now submitted. We'll be in recess for five minutes.